afternoon, good evening, depending when you're watching this episode of In The Mix From The Six. This is the October 23rd, 2020 edition. Welcome back. That is my guy, familiar face, Adis Kuchkovic. I'm Jay Boyle. And <laughs> the only face, bro. These are the only faces they ever see. We've never had a guest. We'll try and improve on that, I guess, maybe. Well, let's see. Well, All we right. Brandon, one day. <laughs> oh, we did have Breton, but you weren't there. So, yeah. All yeah. right. So we've been off for a while. We took a we quarantined COVID break and lots has happened. NBA finals is wrapped up in the meantime. Uh, LeBron James fourth wing. Congrats, not to the Lakers. Congrats to the Lakers. Was that ever in doubt quickly? Like people, you thought the Clippers yeah. could beat the Lakers. I just want to acknowledge on the air here. I thought well, how stupid <laughs> you were, listen, how dumb you were. Listen, the world, the world thinks that the biggest threat to the Lakers winning a championship was the Clippers. Not anyone I didn't, in the though. East I didn't. The I didn't think you know, that. Okay. I think the Clippers burnt themselves out because they were also oh. the first team to leave the bubble. Listen, bro. <laughs> Listen. They give, were the Kawhi, first team give Kawhi and Shitty P more excuses. To leave. Lakers did too. Lakers did too. They thought they had that easy win. And then once it became difficult, they didn't want to Listen, Lakers. Lakers that. wanted to leave too. So don't give me those BS excuses. Don't make more excuses for. Oh, not the team. Not yeah, the team. yes, LeBron maybe yes. Go for like a, a day. Dude, day I don't even. Like, oh, these are the times when oh, I question oh, how. Oh, oh. These are the times that I question how you're even on a podcast because it came out that Clippers and Lakers both wanted to leave the bubble. Yeah, but the, I heard only the Clippers as a whole team wanted to go. Lakers had like still mad. Listen, so if LeBron says you're leaving. The whole team's leaving. <laughs> Who left? Nobody. Neither team. Clippers, bro. <laughs> what do you mean? Nobody left the early. bubble. They yeah, because they, because they suck. They went home early. They went home early because bro. playoff P bro. is shitty P, as I told you time and time again. Bro. Kawhi Leonard when does not have a high motor, see. and Doc Rivers Kawhi is not coach. Not score Keep cutting basket me off. In Twelve minutes. You've never seen that. And it's because, because the man burnt himself out. No one play anymore. We've never seen him in a situation. He's been with the Clippers where he's the un, you know, unheralded leader. It's the first time he's ever been asked to be the unquestionable leader, and he can't do that. He had Kyle Lowry be the leader of the Raptors. He, Kyle Lowry was the leader of that team. Yes. And, and he had Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, and all those guys in San Antonio. Manu Ginobili. Like, let's goes on and on. Danny this Green. Man, this man wanted Paul George so bad. <laughs> And did you see now? Now he wants a point guard. He misses Kyle Lowry. Oh, yeah. All right. Moving on from, from, from useless discussions because yeah. I've been telling you for time the Clippers weren't going to win nothing. Anyways, NFL is in full swing. The Chiefs look just like they did last season, better than anybody else in football. But we'll tell you who the biggest threats to their championship hopes are. And then we're going to get into NBA free agency. The best free agent available is my guy, Double D, Debo, DeMar DeRozan. We'll tell you where we think he should go. I don't think we're going to agree on that. And then we'll get into a oh, UFC, yeah, for, UFC 254. This is the most anticipated fight, probably since Habib versus McGregor. Oh, yeah. I'd say so. Especially with Gaethje's performance at the start of the pandemic. Like yeah, this is how, how he, he, he destroyed Tony Ferguson. We'll tell you where Ferguson sits in. And then yeah. we'll, we'll maybe get into uh, Poirier and Connor set for a January date. And, uh, yeah, that'll wrap up the episode. Oh, and we're bringing back an old segment that we had in the OG days. Wasteman of the week. And before Six Buzz. Before Six Buzz. Stole our segment. Copyrighted. We should sue them. Anyways, we're going to bring that back because I have just some personal beefs to air out. Um, you may have seen if you're one of the few people that follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's personal. Wasteman of the week was always personal. So I gave that to Man Peyton Manning. Not Peyton, sorry, Eli. 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 What? what? Guy got me two rings. Okay, before, way, okay, way after that. Right before Daniel Jones stepped in. That, uh, yeah, yeah. I was waste fan up every week. <laughs> wow. Wow. Listen. Bro. When at least he delivered me rings. Your guy Cam Newton, he should have been waste man last week because he lost me $150 because he doesn't know how to throw a ball away or how to use his legs when he's a running quarterback. Just taking sacks oh. on the last drive. The guy's that, dying that is from COVID-19. Dying, dying. He it wouldn't have been playing. He wouldn't have been playing if he was dying. Oh, he, he skipped death. The guy survived. 
He would have been the first fully healthy athlete to die if he had died. Anyways, let's get into it. All the talk to the NFL. Can anybody beat the Chiefs? And they just added, you know, a guy who hasn't been an elite back for two years, but before that was top yeah. two, if not the number one running back in the league. And maybe yeah, on yeah, the he, he was right there. And he's now a Kansas City Chief. And they just dethrottled and embarrassed the Buffalo Bills, who people thought were a real threat in the AFC. Just stomped on them on national television. They're five and one. Who do you see as the biggest, you know, threats to the Chiefs' title hopes in 2020 slash 2021? We had this discussion before, and I'm sticking to it, man. I'm sticking to Seahawks. I think they're the number one threat to the Kansas City Chiefs, and especially if they were to somehow, I guess, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but if they were to pick up Antonio Brown, that just even makes them a bigger threat. And again, we've discussed this the run game, pass game, they have it all in Seahawks. And defensively, I think they could cause some problems to, with their corners like, to Mahomes, bro. Come on. How? How? What leads you to believe Maybe, that? They, uh, have, they have the last ranked pass defense in the league, and you're saying their corners can provide issues for Patrick Mahomes. Enough to win the pro. When their offense is that strong, they, the defense only got to do so much, right? They don't Listen, have to win the game for them. I'm not saying that that's going to be the difference maker. But Listen. I think they can hold off. Listen, I, I love I love Russell Wilson more than probably a lot of people. I think he's the second best QB in the league. But let's look at what they've done this year because of that defense that is so bad past defense, right? Atlanta, you beat 38-25. Atlanta should not be scoring 25. New England, 35-30. Had to be a close game. Dallas, which has been a tire fire all year, 38-31. Close game. Miami. The fact that it was 31-23 and they needed like, you know, a, a late fourth quarter drive to win, that's not so good. And then the Vikings are terrible and have a terrible QB in Kirk Cousins, and they win by one point, 27-26. So I get it. I love Russell Wilson. I love their offense. But their defense is so bad, and when you go up against Talon like Patrick Mahomes, man, if Russell Wilson is going to have to score 40 points because Patrick Mahomes is going to scorch them for 40. But I Kenny, think, you know, Kenny, they're a contender. They're a contender, contender for sure. Defense, Kenny? Yeah. Who? Did Russell Wilson go off on their Kansas City defense? Because Kansas City defense ain't that strong either. Better than the Seahawks defense, that's for damn sure. And their, their defense playing, is a lot better this year. Straight, it's a straight gun shot with those two playing, man. It's just going to be who can outplay who? Patrick Mahomes versus Russell Wilson. I'm, yeah. I'm, hey, I'm mentioning I, I still think Chiefs favorites. But I'm just mentioning Seahawks as their biggest threat. Yeah. All the other teams See, I don't think if you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have said Seahawks are number one threat. Now I got two teams that might be more of a threat because of the defensive factor, and they still have good QBs, and they actually just played each other last week in, a, in Green Bay and Tampa Bay. Now don't let that loss make you think that Green Bay is now down the gutter. Aaron Rodgers has been playing like it's his 2015 Aaron Rodgers, and he's been doing it with scrub wide receivers. Okay. Devontae Adams left again last week with an injury, I believe. So if he somehow is healthy in the playoffs, and then you have Anthony Lazard. I think Anthony's his first name. Lazard was on fire for three weeks, then had pectoral surgery. He's projected to be back, I think, one, around week 13, week 14, or, you know, going into the playoffs. And then, obviously, oh, man, I forget his name. The tight end, who Tanyan, who had, out of nowhere, you know, um, Aaron Rodgers has turned this guy into prime Gronkowski, it seems like. He's become his first option. And then last week, they were doing really well. But as soon as that second interception happened, Devontae Adams drops the ball out of his hands, and it's a pick six. Just kind of somehow Green Bay seemed defeated. And I'm going with the team that defeated them in Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And a lot of people are writing off Tom Brady saying he seems old. Yeah, he does seem old. But you know what? He's got more options than he ever had. (laughs) He's been old, and he stole two years ago as an old guy, won a Super Bowl. and. With the type of team like this Tampa Bay Buccaneers team is, led by their defense, relying on Tom Brady to be a game manager. And you look at their defense, total yards. They're second best in the league with only 312 against the game. Sixth best passing defense. The number one rushing defense. Eighth best in terms of points allowed. 11th best on third down percentage. Their offense, they might not have a lot of yards, 24th, but they still put up points. They eight the most points. They're a quick strike offense. And that's what it is with Mike Evans. Mike Evans has no yards, but yeah. he catches TDs. And don't look now, 
Rob Gronkowski had a TD and 75, mention, huh? had a TD so and 78, 75-78 regardless, okay. and five receptions. Because and OJ yep. Howard is out for the season, so this is now Gronk's job at tight end to lose. So and I really th- I, th- I, th- I thought the same thing. I thought it would take him a little bit more time to get you know back into the game, but with him back, I don't know. I might be starting to agree with you though. And if you should look out and 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 what can propel you a big win against an elite team like they had last week against Green Bay, yeah. and that was that was a defensive win. Tom Brady threw I think for under 200 yards, but he had a couple passing TDs. Did he, he had two uh, interceptions, Rodgers? Rodgers yeah, did. First one, first one on him, second but on Devontae six, Adams. Yeah, but Rodgers threw 16 for 35. That's rough. Yeah, listen, I'm That's not saying rough, they're the Chiefs. Bro. They're not going to go undefeated, the Packers or yeah. the Buccaneers. But I think don't sleep on them. There's other good teams. And now let, let's hear yours because there's one team I didn't mention that you may, and the people are going to be thinking, how did Jay not mention them? Is he a, is he a doofus? So who, after Seahawks, the other two the was, best competitors. I, two, I was, I was just thinking one other one, and that was okay. Tennessee Titans. And I know they're in the same. What's it called? They're both in the AFC, so hmm. they're playing each other a lot earlier. But like Derrick Henry, man, we were talking about this just before we started recording. I was, I was always under the impression that you don't go all in with the running back because with history, it's shown running backs usually get. You know, injured, or they just never really compete. They never show the same level of skill and just, you know, same performance that they did the previous year. Derrick Henry's a monster. Last three games, this guy gets six touchdowns. In his last game, he ran for 212 yards. And we discussed, I think, the Kansas City defense, especially with the rushing defense, it's going to be a problem against a guy like Derrick Henry. A guy like Tanner Hill, he's coming into his own too, man. Do me a favor. Like, up, I think up, over 1,300 yards. Yeah, do me a favor. Open up Ryan Tannehill's stats. And uh, I'm going to explain to you why I think Tennessee is not the same threat they were last year. Just like I think Seah- Seahawks last couple weeks taking a step back because of their defense, in my opinion, even though they're undefeated. Look, you think, uh, t- Tennessee, Tennessee's got a, a – yeah. You know, their offense is chugging along. It's like a whistle. It's going no hitches. And Tannehill is playing, you know, three pay grades above his level of play. And they paid him. Like he was an elite QB when I said he wasn't, and he's actually playing like that. But come the playoff times, let's see. Because last year in the playoffs, he only threw max, I think, 17 times. And he's going to have to continue this level of play in the playoffs when the pressure is on because look at their defense. This is Seattle Seahawks of the AFC. Total yards, 28. Passing yards, 28. Rushing yards, 26. Point sixteen third down percentage. They have the worst third down percentage on defense. Teams are converting at 57.8% on third down. Like, can Derrick Henry overcome that alone? I don't think so. Can is, is Tannehill have the option, the, the weapons, the weapons with with just AJ Brown as, as your top receiver? Does you know? Like I don't know. So I I don't think Tannehill is going to be that guy come the playoff time again to make them overcome it. And I, I think teams have figured it out. Is Derrick Henry going to be able to have 200 yard games again in the playoffs? I'm will tell. But I don't think Ryan Tannehill is the type of QB that can overcome that defense where Russell Wilson probably is that, you know, has the capability to do it. Tannehill, I don't think so. If the Titans went out there, let's pass offseason when there's QBs available and they got a Brady who's a proven game manager or, or you know, maybe even a Phillip Rivers, I would give them more stake I would put into their pot in terms of the ability for them to beat the Chiefs in probably the AFC Finals. Yeah, but uh, Tennessee was in the AFC Finals last year, right? Uh, was it the finals they lost the Chiefs? Yeah, I think so. I think they, they pulled an upset against... Uh, they upset it? somebody early on. They upset... Was it Baltimore? Baltimore. 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 Yeah. They upset Baltimore. Exactly. And, like, as much as we say, can Derrick Henry really lead them that far? He, he's, he has. You know, last year he did it, and this year he hasn't shown that he's slowing down at all. No, for sure, yeah, and I, I acknowledge that. I just think that's, come that's come madness. Super Bowl time in the playoffs, especially you need versatility, and yeah. the way Tano is playing right now, I don't but think I don't think he's gonna be able to sustain this. You know, a guy like Russell Wilson last year was phenomenal yeah. through twelve games, and even he fell off. We see Drew Brees often do the same thing where he's great through. 12, 14 weeks, and he falls off. So if guys like Russell Wilson and Drew Brees having trouble sustaining that for 16 games plus the playoffs, can Ryan Tannehill do that? I have no reason to believe that he can do that. 
No, fact. But as we let's look at it from the Kansas City view. What could they do to stop a guy like Henry? Especially the, like what what they did it last year. Can they provide? They did it last year. No, but I'm saying this year. Especially if this guy keeps going the way he's going. Listen, it's just throwing bodies like, because that's, gonna that's be what, it, what it's going to – well, here's, what, here's, what it's, here's what it's going to come down to in the playoffs, right? Now, this is even more film and, and time studied on your opponent. And if they think Tannehill can't beat them, then it becomes yeah. you're just playing primarily rush defense. And there's no versatility. There's no threat of the pass and play actions. Then it becomes a lot easier to defend the run than when right now when Tannehill is a good throwing threat. So it's really good. Like I said, it's going to come down to Tannehill. If, yeah. if he sustains his level of play, it becomes a lot harder to defend Derrick Henry because Tannehill can throw the ball, obviously. But if, if Tannehill falls off, well, then you're just throwing different type of blitz looks at them. Okay, fine. If it ain't Seattle and if it ain't Tennessee. Who is I'm not saying it ain't. I'm just saying why no, no, no. I don't. I'm saying who do you think? I, I think I, I told you I think Green Bay and Tampa are gonna pose bigger threats if they get to the Super Bowl because the defense. Oh, yeah, I you got a third. No, it was Seattle I put in there, and then yeah. like Green Bay oh, and yeah, Tampa Bay. Yeah. And I know I can't. I hope some people you know comment and bash me because I don't think a lot of people believe in Tampa Bay. And even Green never, Bay. And you know what? I'm done like. Doubting, oh, oh Aaron, Aaron Rodgers doesn't have the options. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have the options. Like, come on, man. Aaron Rodgers took a little hit to his pride, though. You see that little celebration he did with the, the pump? Yeah, and yeah. And then to lose that bad after? Like, you don't think that's going to fuel a great athlete like that? 16 for 35, and then to lose the game, what, 27 to 10? You don't think that's going to fuel that's a great athlete good. like Aaron Rodgers? Good, but it could also send him back a little. I don't think Aaron Rodgers type of guy who's gonna get set back after one loss. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's had two interceptions before. Say, like that's that's <laughs> tough for you to say. Oh, that's gonna set them back. I think a, a yeah, good. A weird thing, <laughs> I think a good win propels you when you're a good team further than you know a tough loss is is gonna defeat you less. Yeah, but okay, but for let's say Green Bay to get to playing Kansas City and becoming a threat for uh, them. The, the, the NFC, make playoff, it out of the, NFC. Yeah, the, the NFC playoffs are way tougher for sure. Exactly. Right, like, like and I San, honestly San think Fran, the best team in the NFC is Seattle. Yeah, I would agree. But uh, right now, but again, we'll, we'll see come playoff time. Playoff, playoff and it's also for me, it comes down to Pete Carroll's coaching decisions. I don't think he's an elite coach. I think if there's a different coach in there who had a pass first offense over a run first offense, I think Russell Wilson probably has, you know, at least two Super Bowls right now, if not three. Yeah, but uh, do we do we do we give up on Baltimore? Yeah, I don't believe in Lamar. I never. Have. It, was only, it used to be a Baltimore Kansas City thing in the NFC. Uh, that was like Kansas City. Only. Listen, you have to dismiss them when you saw Kansas City just roll right through them earlier this season. That's what I'm saying. I think that game kind of took them out of that. Position. And like I said, Lamar has not shown me enough to say that he's going to become, you know, even an average or above average passer. Yeah. That's true. That's so, true. I just yeah. until I see that they're not going to be in my mind in that title conversation. Um, hey, they could prove me wrong. I hope they do because I don't like. It's like the NBA when we knew Golden State was going to get there. I don't like that in sports. That, yeah. And that's why I love the NHL so much because you can yeah. never predict who's going to win the Stanley Cup in the NHL. Like yeah, every especially year, now that we just got rid of New England, you know they weren't always the team that's in the Super Bowl. I don't want another team that wants to take that position. Where it's yeah, exactly. like every year we see the same. Shit. It takes out what we love about sports when that's the case. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to a different NFL topic. I want to start with probably, not probably, I definitively the worst division we've seen in the league in the last 15 to 20 years, the NFC East. They have a combined how many wins? Uh, Dallas has got one. Six. Philly's got two. Oh, yeah. Giants two, got one. Four. Redskins got one. Does Dallas have one or two? Um, like five or six Dallas wins. Has two. So, so six okay, so wins have... combined through six weeks among four teams. <laughs> Who cares make it out of that position? <laughs> it's awful. Probably gonna be believe stubborn, huh? that a team is going to make the playoffs with probably five, six wins. <laughs> it's happened, bro. I think Carolina – didn't Carolina do that one year? I think, I it was think their they last had seven. They had seven. They had seven. Oh, yeah, let's see. Yeah. Who do you, who's your pick to make the playoffs at the NFC East? Philly. Especially 
Especially would, Dallas is out now with freaking Prescott out for the season. I, I would agree. Andy Dalton, I don't know. That team's a mess. And you, I don't, I don't know. have any belief in Andy Dalton. Well, it's not even Andy Dalton for me. It's that the coaching staff, you heard the, the rumblings out of the locker room where the coaching yeah. staff, the players are saying the coaching staff is totally underprepared. So They couldn't do it with Prescott. They couldn't make the playoffs. For how long, though? The last two years, they haven't made playoffs. Yeah, well, somehow, a, a, every with first... Dalton, yeah. Well, with, with Prescott, the first half, they would just drop the ball and be down 20 points and then put up a you know a fight in the second half, but too little, too Crazy. late. Yeah. Every okay. single time. And uh, thankfully for them, the reason they beat the Giants was, was Prescott was in the game just long enough before Dalton took over. And the Giants, as they usually do, as we did last night, find ways to win, which I'm fine with because rebuild, I want a top pick. Yeah. But... Yeah, I think I would agree with Philly. What do you think about a guy like Prescott, though? What do you, uh, what do you mean? Him coming back, do you think he's anything the same or just worse than what he's doing here? Here's the thing. Like, he's on QB. But he's not as mobile as a QB as people think he is. He's he's a pocket passer. Yeah. So, But he was. If, if, when he first started out, he was really mobile. And he was like, you know, he branded more often. Now yeah. it's like... Ball. I'm kind of worried about if you, have the, if you have the Cowboys open, check how many times he's run the ball this year. His rushing yards. He's become more of a pocket passer. So I don't think it's going to impact him as much in ankle injury. Now, I believe it was his right foot. So you do get to generate some power from there. But I would be, I would be more concerned if it was Lamar Jackson that, you know, suffered that horrific of an ankle injury. Facts, yeah. Or even yeah. Ezekiel on freaking Dallas. Yeah. Uh, I mean, here's the thing. Is what Dallas, it is. I don't think Dallas is really going anywhere with or without him. Yeah, and even, even Ezekiel Elliott, like, two fumbles last game. And then you saw him after that. He was running with both hands on the ball like this. <laughs> I, I'm not a running back. I'm not an expert. But I don't think that's going to give you, a, you know, max mobility running the ball when you have both hands like this on the ball. It doesn't, bro. You, everyone knows to run quick, you got to use those arms too. Yeah. You can't have a wrap in front of your chest. Outside arm's got the ball. Inside arm, you got to use a stiff arm and fight through defenders. And if you're like this... Okay. Man, it's hard to get through tackles. That's a little insecure, you know? Like, yeah, he dropped two fumbles, but yep. that's sort of changing up the way you're running it, too. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Wasteman of the Week. And before we do that... <laughs> Your boy! I, hold on. Before we get there, I just wanted to give the first example as to why one of them is going to share this honor. So I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, we'll just... For everybody who's already seen this... You seeing the video right now? Yeah, I'm seeing it. We'll just okay. give everybody the laugh that they all deserve whenever you watch this. It's a beautiful run, though. Ooh, ooh. Beautiful 80 yard run. I know. Beautiful. Perfect. Oh, I'm running too fast. I'm running too fast. <laughs> you should have just faked an injury at that point, though. Because I thought you hurt your ankle. <laughs> Look at him get up. <laughs> No one's even trying to give him props. Oh, my God. And what did he say after the game when they asked him what happened on that play? He said, I was trying to run faster than I was. We all need to do our part to help me. Oh. You know what he means, though. I know as much as you want to hate on this man right now, you know what, what he means. What he, I, I, he I, I've, I've never been running, trying to run so fast that I fall on my face. So no, I but you ever, know. like, it's almost like... Uh, yeah, you feel like you're tripping, that, but then I, I'm, a, I'm able, an athlete I'm enough, to maintain my balance. And this guy's an NFL quarterback we're talking about. Every time, you know, every time you're getting chased, let's say you're getting chased by a dog, you're getting chased by a police officer, I don't know what, you're getting chased by someone, and you're running so fast, you have this adrenaline pumping, and you start stumbling, you're like, what the, why is this the one time I can't run properly? You Listen, know what I mean? You can make That's no excuses. You can make no excuses for this man. So the first of two guys who gets my waste man of the week is Daniel freaking Jones. Danny Dimes, as they call him, after he had two, you know, above average games in his rookie season last year. And he's been god awful this season. He has more fumbles than you can possibly imagine. And the second guy I'm going to give waste man of the week to is the mother effer who drafted him named David Gettleman. This, I just want to bring back the quote. That he said after he drafted him. And they said, why did you draft Daniel Jones? And what did you see him? He said, I knew he was the man for the job after watching one series at Duke. One series of watching him play for a mediocre team in one of the worst Division I conferences 
in NCAA football. He didn't play against elite talent, only started 12 games, took him, what, seventh overall. And let me just explain to you how bad this guy, Daniel Jones, has been this year. So in seven, in seven mm. games started, he's only thrown five TDs. He hadn't thrown a TD yeah. in two and a half games before this past game. And uh, let's just see. You know, what is his yardage at? 14-10, not great. Yards per game, 201. That's a 30-second rank of starting QBs. He's got seven interceptions. He's lost 120 yards due to sacks. He's fumbled the ball five times. And in his career, he's fumbled the ball more than games he's played. He's fumbled the ball, I believe, 24 times in his career already. And he's played, what, seven, seven games this year? And he played, like, 10 games last year? So he's got, like, 24 fumbles in 17 games. That's not exactly, but it's about there. That is how bad this mother effer has been. And let's just build on that. Gettleman and Jones combined. Offensive stats for the Giants this year. Total yards, 32nd with 299. Passing yards, 30th. So third last in the league. Passing yards, we average 184 only per game. Rushing yards, 26th. Points, 31st for 17.4. Listen, I get we are rebuilding, but... Most QBs, we always talk about it. Their second year, they take that step. And that's when you see if they're going to make it work. Yeah. They start to learn how to read NFL defenses. And none of that has happened. And I have no reason to believe any of that is going to happen. And with Saquon Barkley's blown ACL, and who knows how his knee's going to be moving forward, yes. I have no reason to believe in any faith and progression to occur in this organization. And the saddest part is if the Jets somehow get a win and we finish with the top pick, Unless we fire David Gettleman, we won't draft Trevor Lawrence. We'll trade down. And even if we fire David Gettleman, why did you fire a guy a year after you let him hire a new coaching staff and bring in Jason Bloody Garrett in as our offensive coordinator? Are you kidding me? So either way, whether you keep Gettleman and trade down, whether you fire Gettleman and draft Lawrence, it's just a tire fire, this whole organization. New York, New York football is in such a shitty place right now. It's unbelievable with the Giants and Jets together in that city. I, I, I'm, I'm done. Like, man, it's so tough. Like, I've laughed at the Giants for long enough. Switch teams. Get out of there, bro. Switch teams. Get out of there, bro. You can't switch teams. You can't get any better for the next few years. So you can't switch what's, teams. What's, what's but you know what? Last night, when I, I saw Daniel Jones do that, I first started laughing my ass off. And then the laugh turned to just sad. Just not a cry, but a sadness inside my soul. Because that's our quarterback. And he's not going anywhere. It's like... I know, that's what I'm there's, saying. There's like, an, a 90, there's like a 98% chance he's our starting quarterback for the next 10 plus years. Okay, I don't know about that. Well, I don't know. Like, he's, he, he can end up being mediocre enough. Years, he can oh, end up being dude. mediocre enough. I'm just... I have no reason to believe that it's going to get any better. So that's my. So what should they do? What should they do? They should. I don't Tell know. Me. They should pay somebody to lose against the Jets, but I don't think anybody can lose against the Jets. And you pray, you pray, you somehow get the first overall pick. You draft Trevor Lawrence, obviously, and then you, you fire David Gettleman. You fire Jason Garrett. You can keep Joe Judge as a head coach, but you need a new OC. Jason Garrett is not cutting it. He has no idea what's going on in the NFL offensive game right now. He didn't even call plays for Dallas. He hadn't called plays in four or five years. And then he comes to the Giants, calls offensive plays, and he sucks at it. Yeah, the only chance you guys have at winning, uh, Jets winning your game is uh, Miami Dolphins. But with two us start, I think Dolphins, started, Dolphins right? just beat them, didn't they? Last week. So, no, but I'm saying, like, besides them, you guys are playing Kansas City Patriots. I mean, not you guys. Jets are playing Kansas City Patriots, Raiders, Seahawks, Browns, and then Patriots again. I mean, that's not yeah, So, <laughs> maybe they can somehow beat the Dolphins, but I doubt it. So, we're going to get the second <laughs> overall pick. Man. We're going to take the second overall pick. We took an offensive yeah. tackle with the fourth overall pick lo- last year. He didn't even play last week. It didn't start. Coach says it's due to injury, but I'm pretty sure it's due to performance because the guy sucks and has cement blocks for feet. Andrew Thomas, I believe his name is. And what are we going to do second overall pick? We're going to take an interior defensive. We're going to take a bloody nose tackle with the second overall pick. Okay, but yo, that run from Daniel Jones, 
that 80 yard run. I know it wasn't a touchdown run. Great, it great run. Really, but really that is, run. was a really good great run. Touch. Really good run. But that just sums up the giant season and what happens in the NFC East. And it's a battle, a Thursday night game between two teams in the NFC East. And the quarterback face plants himself when he has a clear lane to a touchdown. And that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna leave this segment at is because I can't talk about the depressing giants so much longer. All right, we're moving on to the National Basketball Association and we got some big news from the man Shams Sharania today reporting that the NBA is targeting a December 22nd start date, and they would have about three weeks of training camp before that, so training camps would open up about the start of December, which is pretty close. And they would finish before the, end, uh, the Summer Olympics would happen, so NBA players would be able to go. And yeah. Commissioner Silver talked about that. He goes, it's one thing. He goes, you know, Team USA, yeah, we'd be impacted, but the rest of the world would be even worse because they're nothing without the NBA players. You know, Spain's, Argentina's, and Lithuania's and all that. Uh, right? Uh, they would, like, then the NBA could still field some decent talent, right? With teams yeah. that would be out of the playoffs, but, you know, the rest of the nations would be just scorched. But then the biggest news coming out of that is right now, if you come to Canada, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So what would the Raptors do? We saw the Blue Jays have to play in Buffalo this past season. Reports are the Raptors are exploring playing out of the Kentucky Wildcats facility. What do you think of that? I think it's just another way that they're trying to hurt us. So you keep saying that. I mean, like, how are they trying I'll to hurt us? What. That is the I'll fact of what. the matter. What other NBA team is going to have to stay away from? Like, okay. Nobody, uh, but there's no other the NBA team there. in Canada. That's not the NBA's fault. Yeah, but no, but I'm telling you that. Oh, they're gonna be the only team they're gonna be missing back home and their families and shit. Why is no other like this? This this was the big issue with the bubble, right? They had to bring the families in. Yeah, yeah, I get that, but this is How not the end. But this is not the NBA's fault. This is the reality of the situation. You gotta, but then you gotta make it work for everyone. You won't just make it work oh, for the majority dude, of them. Dude, that's so, so ridiculous of a statement. The MLB didn't have to do that for the Blue Jays. They want to bring their families to Kentucky? Go ahead. Blue Jays, some of them brought their families yeah, to sure to Buffalo and something. They something. come back for freaking, wait, how long is the season get? When's the season going to end? Uh, they're in the World Series now. No, no, I'm saying uh, the NBA season. Uh, the Warriors start it? December 23rd. It would end sometime, like sometime July, I believe. Olympics are going to be late July yeah, so or you're gonna have these guys wait If they were, let's say they do make, like, they... Make a run be six, seven months. Stuff, or six, seven to months. Away from their families, bro, and their kids and stuff. People are having problems for two months, bro. Give them, give them five alone. Yeah. And they'll be so freaking here's a, five. So here's the thing, though. What we're hearing is the Canadian government may modify their quarantine rules to where you just have to complete a negative COVID test upon entering the a country at the airport. But I'll, I don't know how that's going to work. You probably have to do another one after, a few days later. Because sometimes, you know, you might catch COVID, but he's not going to show symptoms. He's not going to show a positive test for a few days. Um, which this also has impacts on the NHL for the same reason. Obviously, if they change those rules, then the NBA could have the Raptors in Toronto. And the NHL right now, there's talks of them having a Canadian division where just the Canadian teams playing each other. And then the Canadian teams for a period would travel to the South and play American teams, but for primarily would just be playing in Canada. And obviously, if that rule changes, the NHL could have normal play um, as well. So a lot of stuff we're waiting on the Canadian government. We don't really have a lot of information, so we're not going to spend too much I time think on this. If the no, I know. But I'm just saying. I think if a player tests, gets on the plane, gets lands, tests, game time tests, play, where's the issue? Yeah, yeah, not, they yeah. They'll be, they'll be, yeah. Well, they'll have to test game day as well, right? And now we're getting quick tests test that can come day. back within hours, yeah. like they did in the bubble. <laughs> And they All have right. those quick tests now. I think yeah, that's, that's, that's what I just said. You may not have heard Zoom issues. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get into NBA free agency, shall we? So the number one free agent in my mind is DeMar DeRozan. So I want to hear your thoughts. Where do you think DeMar should sign basketball-wise? Because we know he's going to consider ev- other things, obviously. All we can decide for him is where we think he should go basketball-wise. Where do you think the destination should be? I'm just thinking because... Like, I'm thinking it on the base on, like, the type of player that he is. Yeah. Do you put him in there with another star? And if you do, does it work? Because he's kind of a, not a ball stopper, but, like, see, 
he's just not, go finish, finish your statement. Finish your statement like, before I I'm just, before I'm, I rip I'm you apart. I'm thinking he's gonna have to jump on a team where he is their number one option, and the offense is mostly gonna run through him. I, he came I, into San, he came into San Antonio. He has who? Marcus Aldridge with him, who yep. at the same time also is not playing to no Marcus Aldridge for you, but used to and used to. But was this not the first playoffs that Popovich and San Antonio has missed in like how many years? And last year, they made the playoffs. They took Denver to a game seven. And what did the Rosen do? He got himself ejected out of the game. I, I, I know you love him. And I know the love you have for him. I know how angry you are at me right now. But I do think that he needs to be put on a team where he is, their offense is almost run through him. And he is their number one option. So just give me a I second. don't have a specific team in my head, really. And he did step up. He saw, what, 51% rate. And I know that's fantastic. He averaged less points, but that's also because his percentage went up. I'm so kidding. This guy's just so mad, bro. <laughs> bro, if there's – like, I love DeRozan, but if there's anyone that loves DeRozan, like, like he knows him, like he's boys with him, like they've been boys since they were born, it's Jake. <laughs> <laughs> So here's where, where I'm, I'm going to prove you wrong to what you said, that he's a ball stopper. He needs to be the number one option, all right? Um, he's not a ball stopper. I don't, I don't, I don't just like just shut, up, shut up for a second, would you? Jesus, Murphy, bro. So here's the thing. LaMarcus Aldridge is what you call a ball stopper and needs the offense to run through him. DeMar DeRozan, you did not – and you, well, at least you didn't when he got to San Antonio and he's learned under Popovich's system, all right? So this season, so regular season including the bubble – he averaged actually 5.6 assists per game. Then, in the bubble, he was even better because there was games where he was the pseudo point guard and Popovich had the trust in him to do that. And in those two ga- three games, he, one game he had 13, 5, and 12. Didn't have a great shooting game, he had 12 assists. Another one, a win against Sacramento, he had 27 points, 5 rebounds, 10 assists, double-double. Then another one, he had 18, 5, and 8. So, he played pseudo point guard and was dictating the offense and moving the ball around. He also was picking his shots a lot better and efficient field goal percentage. He, he had the best field goal percentage in the bubble, like the regular season games that were there in the eight games. He had the best field goal percentage and had the most fourth quarter points with 12 points. Became an unbelievable closer while still moving the ball around and showed that he can play in a system and can orchestrate an offense in terms of besides just going ISO basketball. And he even talked about that on the J.J. Reddick podcast saying, you know, with San Antonio was so different. The Raptors, like, you're just giving the ball, let me go ISO. And how much that has changed for him and his outlook on basketball. That's why I believe the best landing spot for him, Paul Millsap comes off the books, he should be going to the Denver Nuggets. Because they're, they're, a, they're a decent three-point shooting team, but they're a very slow-playing team. They're one of the slowest teams in terms of pace in the damn league. I'll pull a stat up right here. I think they were 29th. And yeah, 29th in terms of pace. Now, a lot of that because of Nikola Jokic. But now, when Jokic is on the floor or off the floor, you have options to spread the floor I mean, in terms of getting up ahead quicker and using some of more of Jamal Murray's assets, who I believe Jamal Murray is the best player on that team going forward, especially after what we saw yeah. in the playoffs, over Nikola Jokic. And it's what was that team way. lacking? They would always go to two-man ball in the fourth quarter. But it's, at times, it was great against Utah. Against the Clippers, when you get to a Lakers team, so you have to go two-man ball against the Lakers, a great defensive team who's playing so hard. So you need that third option. They're a decent enough three-point shooting team. And they, not only might they lose Paul Millsap, but Jeremiah Grant also opted out of his contract. So he could be gone too. They have the dollars available. I just think they need that. Then not only, you know, the financial reasons, but I think he can help a guy like Jamal Murray. He learned from Propovich in terms of playmaking. And Jamal Murray is not a great playmaker. And Damar has shown so much growth playmaking that he can help Jamal there. He can also help Jamal Murray with his mid-range. And Jamal loves shooting those. And we know DeRozan is the best or top three mid-range Same player the in the league. Exactly. And he's great at getting to the hoop. And can help Jamal grow that area too. But for me, it's that team. Denver is, you know, a third legitimate scorer. Scoring threat away from really contending in that Western Conference. Like, if they got Damar DeRozan, man. Like, Lakers, I will maybe still pick the Lakers, but ooh, that would be a way better series than what we saw five games in this past um, season. And they would, you know, shred the Clippers again. And, and listen, they've, so had good regular, the they've, had, right? they've had good regular season success. Yeah, he'd be playing the two, Jamal the one. And I think he fits yeah. in so well in that system there. I just want to say this now because Jay, of anyone that I know, has shit on – 
if your team's best players are the backcourt, if your team is all no, all no, 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 no. But Jokic you will is not there. win the championship. Did you but not Jokic is there. But you just Jamal said would be the third the option. Best on the team. No, I didn't. No, I'm saying, uh, sorry, Murray's the best player on the team, right? Yeah, I said Murray's going to take over. Jokic is still ahead of DeMar for sure. DeMar would be the third option. I say we need two best players led by the backcourt, and that's just Steph and Clay. Jokic is still there. That's the difference. You have the linkage. And that's I why know. I say, and it's not just the backcourt. It's why I say, you know, the Pelicans didn't work with AD and Cousins. There's no connection between the backcourt and the frontcourt. They have that because of DeMar, Jamal, and Jokic. They have that connection. So, uh, and it's the same. That's why you can't have the backcourt, right? It's just like so work then. It doesn't work. Yeah. They they don't have that but solidified Portland big man. Portland don't don't even. Oh my god! Don't give me no door, door kitch, bro. Like he's a scoring oh, option, bro. like Jokic. No, huh? he's, not the, he's nowhere near the offensive player as Jokic, though. That's totally different. Nurkic is a. He's, I'm gonna get your rebounds and 10, 12 points a night. Jokic dictates play. He's not as consistent as Jokic. No, oh, he's nowhere near. But he's had he's 30, near. 40 point games. What are you talking about, yeah, bro? He's Boy had some, but he can't monster. can't do the regularly. He doesn't have the shot like Jokic. Doesn't have the playmaking ability of Jokic. The playmaking is the only thing I give him. Oh my he God! You shot. are. He has, you are. The, he has the perimeter. He has the mid range, and he has the inside game. Scoring wise, you're, you're crazy. Me, you're crazy. Are you kidding me, bro? That he can. He average. That he can bro. score like Jokic. He came back from an injury and dropped thirty Dude. and ten. He's he's average. No, what are you about? talking about? He's a decent center, but Jokic can pull up. He's not know, a one, decent center, one bro. Foot. <laughs> I just gave you the what, numbers. You, what, what, you, where do you, what, you think he's best center in the league? He's, no, but he's a top center in the league. Yeah, but there's not that many good centers in the league anymore anyways. There's Embiid, Jokic, Nokic, and, and AD. And Embiid, yeah. Yeah, like, dude, get out of here. Jokic, can go, Jokic can go one-footed, step-back, fadeaway three-pointers in the playoffs. <laughs> Nurkic cannot do <laughs> that. Look at sloppy as fuck, bro. There's but he's no hitting them. But he's hitting them. He's hitting them. And, and he's, the, he's, what, he's a top-five playmaker in the league, too. He's a better all-around player. You can agree on that. So just yeah. chill yourself. No, I do, but I'm just saying. No, like, I get what, I, I I get what you tried. I get, I get what you tried doing there by, you know, throwing my own mantra in my face, but <laughs> it didn't work. It it, no, it didn't. We'll let the viewers decide if it worked. And not even that. Well, let's see if this whole bubble basketball, you know, like what they were saying, that with those few games and that little amount of time, that that was the reason these players got to rest midway through the season, if that was actually a real thing. Because Murray, like, he solidified himself as the top player on that team. During this bubble thing, but is he yeah. going to continue that way? That's what I want well, to see. Well, keep keep in mind with Murray too. He didn't even have a training camp in the bubble, right? Yeah, I know, but he's still it. he's still overperformed. Yeah, but a lot of those guys had a long rest, right? So they all came in ready to go. All right, whatever. Like I don't know. You you couldn't even think of a destination. I'm just saying. Guy, I want to so. see Murray continue it before I say putting the rose on that team makes them the biggest threat to the Lakers. Come on, you're still forgetting about all the other teams in the West. Okay, well, let's run to the other teams in the West. Like Golden State, if Steph and Clay are healthy, yeah, for sure. Houston, I'm, like, just stop, stop. Out. Houston, get out of here. <laughs> I'm not, bro. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm okay, so then, and then, and then the, the Clippers, West. like, I don't know. I think Golden State is Clippers, bro. So, Clippers, Ty Lue over Doc Rivers is going to make that big of a difference. I think they need a point guard and they need a, and need a proper big. Like I said, they have no big threat. So, it's... Yeah. And the but problem is, the problem Merrill, is though, another uh, an, an, another up. problem with the Clippers is I saw somebody talking about this the other day. I forget who it was. You have a guy who is the man in Kawhi Leonard, and a guy yeah. who wants to be the man in Paul George, yeah. right? With the Raptors, everybody knew Kawhi was the man, and Kalo fell on b- behind him. Everybody knew their roles. It worked well. When Kawhi was in San Antonio, it was the same thing. Everybody knew their roles. Yeah. Paul George, come on. And that's the same thing like with Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. Both think they're the man and should be the man, and they're clashing. So Clippers got yeah, a lot of well, things to figure yeah. out before I can say they're the number one threat to the, to the Lakers again next year. I know, but I'm saying like, got, the chemistry is being built now because like, Paul George spent one year in OKC. Out. Yeah. Was, uh, he didn't work with Westbrook. Goes out to Clippers, dude, plays the one year, didn't work out. Talk like, about chemistry. It. Shut up with and, chemistry. It's a real thing, bro. It's not a fucking. How how long did Kawhi play on the Raptors for? First year they won the chip. But Kawhi came in there and Laurie's taking him out to dinner and shit, bro. Whining and dining, you guy. 
So oh, the, Raptors that's, on, the the guys that's, on, God, that's on the mentality of the whole Clippers organization and the team if they could yeah, not make Kawhi and PG feel well. How long I do the Lakers have? What do you mean? AD and the, the Lakers had a brand new AD team this season. AD best friend since they were born, bro. Get out of here. <laughs> born. <laughs> Those two, Ron was playing bro, in the league while AD two, was in diapers. Bro, I watched game one, of the first game of those two playing together, and it looked like they've been playing together for years. No, but that it's, was... Bro, I'm, not, I'm going that. beyond AD. Also, like, Danny Green. Yeah. Okay, who's most relevant? Like, KCB was there before, but A.V. Bradley comes in fresh. Dwight Howard comes in fresh. JaVale, I, was JaVale there last year? Is he Golden State still? Like, they had, like, eight rotation oh, yeah, guys were, bra- were brand new this season. Like, that was a whole new team. They had more change than the Clippers had. Yeah, but not enough. It was the big stars, that's the thing, right? Yeah. So we know this about NBA games. The best players are always going to win the games at the end of the day, especially Listen, in these tight series. I'm telling, I'm telling you this much. To me... Paul George can't want to be the player. To me, to me, I'm picking Lakers to win the, the chip next season. Same. And... Clippers are not or Brooklyn. number one competition. To me, it's if Golden State is fully healthy and Andrew Wiggins fits in with Stephen Clay, that's probably the number one competition. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, if we see the Stephen Clay that we've seen before, of course, they're the main competition for Lakers. All right. What? That, hold on. I'll stop. We're, we're, we're going off on a tangent here on time. I don't want to get into yeah. a three-hour episode. So... <laughs> Let's let's save the Raptors talk for next episode. Their off-season plans because NBA free agency is still a few weeks away. Um, yeah. UFC 254. All right, this is what you've been waiting for. Habib, Nurmaga Madoff versus Justin nice. Savage Gagey. <laughs> I saw you in practice, and you said that perfect. <laughs> I ain't been practicing. I'm just yeah, a, you said perfect, bro. Exactly. All right, 254 good. lightweight division champ. Title holder versus interim title holder. What's the path to victory for each? Who are you picking to win? Okay, well, pa- path to victory is kind of it's kind of obvious. We we know right? we know we know Habib's path yeah. to victory. Habib's got to take his ass down. Gaethje's yeah. got to stay up, right? But where I really think I said this with Mads with all and Usman too. This is I feel, I'm not trying too much comparisons here because Gaethje's obviously a lot better wrestler than Mads with was. But I told you every time. They step outside of that inner octagon against the wrestler. You're done. You're done. Because he's either going to take you down or he's going to hold you against the cage like Usman did. Yeah. And Gaethje, to win, he has to keep going forward. No matter what this, this guy's doing to you, he's hitting you with big shots. If he's trying to trip you, take you down, keep moving forward. As soon as he starts backing up or circling out or any of that, fight's done. And, so, I, and I think that's what's going to happen. Here's the one I thing I, I, I was thinking about coming to this fight. Now, Conor McGregor is obviously, a, I think, in my opinion, I think you would agree, a better striker than Justin Gaethje is. But Justin Gaethje has a more, very much prolific wrestling history, was a champion NCAA wrestler. So I would think he poses a better competition for Habib because of his wrestling ability and then can get out of those clinches and takedowns to get it back up, up, up on, you know, onto the floor. Would you agree with that? Here's the thing. Of course, that's true. But... I actually, one of the one of these commentators, I can't remember his freaking name now, but he brought this up. He said Gaethje, because he's so, like, his thing is, like, striking he wants to do, and what else he knows is wrestling, and a high-level wrestling, right? When he gets taken down or tripped, he's going to try to get up like a wrestler. And the problem with getting up like a wrestler is what's Khabib's main way of winning for the last two fights, at least. You've seen them back-to-back. Choking man's out, right? And when yeah. you get up like a wrestler, you give up your back. Because what you do is you turn around, you push up, right? Yeah. And you give up your back against Khabib. I think that's a huge problem. Because so, what Connor did good is Connor, like as soon as Khabib got him down, you saw in the first round he wrapped him up, held him, didn't take any damage. Yeah. And that's why I think Connor, like the way he was at least trying to get up, works better than what I think Gaethje's gonna attempt. And I think he could get caught in choke. Hold. Really? So here's the, the one thing I think nobody's been able to figure this out. Can, is Gaethje going to be the one to be able to prevent Habib from getting his two legs around your one leg, doing that weird serpent snake thing? And then when he's got your leg, he ain't letting go. Now you only have one leg to push off of when he has you against the fence so he's on the ground. Is Gaethje going to be the one guy to be able to prevent that from happening? He could because when Gaethje was uh, in college especially and 
all these tournaments he did, what he was was a defensive wrestler, meaning he won the competitions stopping the takedowns and kind of really? controlling the guy. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember Jordan Burroughs. I think not Jordan Burroughs. <laughs> oh, what's his name? Oh, whatever. He's like the best wrestler in the U.S. Top level. He's still wrestling. I can't remember his name. But him, he had this notorious matchup with Gaethje. And the first time they uh, wrestled, he took Gaethje down, popped his ribs, took him down so hard. Second time they fought, Gaethje stopped all. Like, he lost the wrestling match still, but he stopped the takedowns. And that's mm. what he was known for in wrestling. So that's why I think if anyone posts the biggest threat stopping takedowns, it is 100% Gaethje. All right. Your pick for to win the fight and method of victory. I got Khabib winning by third round. Rear naked choke. Rear naked choke. This guy didn't just say exactly. TKO or KO. Oh, I know the exact Rear submission. naked choke. How much money are you going to put on that? I already put money on. <laughs> I put $20 on a eight fight parlay. So I'm going to get some good money there. You're just, you're just throwing and away your money because you never hit those. You're terrible at parlay for the UFC. I'm you never hit one in your life. <laughs> okay, so what did you put on the third round uh, TKO by Habib? 50. You put 50? Yeah. It's not TKO. So. Submission. Because I don't think Gage is the type of guy who's not going to get knocked out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's He's what I meant. I don't know these stuff. UFC yeah. terms. They're all irrelevant to yeah. me. Um, yeah. Wow. First time yeah. with a full-time job in your life. I think falling out, eh? At first, it's going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Khabib can't take him out so easily. And then Khabib's going to trip him at the end of the first round. Second round's gonna come in, he's gonna do the exact same thing, and he's gonna get him down a lot easier. And I don't think it's gonna be as competitive as people are talking. I, I really think Khabib's just gonna maul this guy. So, here's the last question I'll ask you kind of before we go to that look of the division. Do you think Gaethje comes out, start of the fight, and says, I gotta knock this motherfucker out? Or, like, you know, do some real damage? You gotta is, show some real threat to the guy. Is that, that gotta or be his outlook? Happen. Like, you know, that first bell rings. I think Gaethje's got to attack him without, you know, sacrificing his yeah. legs to good takedown. But I think he's got to hit him a few times to wobble him earlier. Yeah. That's his only option. But the thing is, you saw with uh, who I personally think was Khabib's hardest fight, and I still think he is Khabib's hardest fight, at least one of them, besides the GSP thing that they're talking about, is Conor McGregor. What did the guy do start of the fight? Remember he ran through flying knees and shit? And you're like, what yeah. the? F and even Khabib was kind of having trouble. It was the first time Khabib ever lost a round was against Conor McGregor, right? Yeah. And I think because of how precise Conor's striking is, it makes him way bigger of a threat than someone like Gaethje. Because Gaethje's going to swing at you. And swing it at a wrestler, you know, you kind of open yeah. yourself up to get, go right under and take you down. All right. Moving forward, after this fight, do you think... The winner, whoever it is, who do they fight? Do they fight the winner of Poirier McGregor in January, or does Ferguson have that spot? Like, if Habib wins, are they going to really try apparently, to make that fight again? Apparently, it's, uh, what's it called? It's GSP. Because Khabib's got one more fight after this. It's not GSP. Bro, so, let me tell you this. Let me explain. So oh, here's, the thing, starting... here's the thing. I don't care what you're going to explain. GSP's yeah. not coming back. Uh, like, people have talked to him recently. Canadian UFC guys, not these Americans who are making these fake, you know, rumors. He's not yeah. coming back to the UFC. He's not he said, fighting. Though? You see what he said? What did he say? Once I start training, I, I say, yeah, I want to do Khabib. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I, but he, he's not head, training. Bro. He's not doing yes. nothing. But he's broke. The guy said, who is the Aero Hawani reported this, so you can trust this because it's a Canadian guy, right? Yeah, yeah. GSP, so Khabib goes on Twitter, says, hey, it's Gaethje, and then after that, it's GSP, and I'm done. Because at the start of Khabib's career, he said, yeah, yeah, I'm aware. Him and his father said, 30 and 0, that's our goal. Once we hit 30 and 0, we're done. And he always says his dream last matchup is GSP. GSP apparently from Hawaii says, he, got, he saw that, whatever, the Instagram comment. And first thing he said, oh, I got to go to the gym. Because he knows now, the only issue with that GSP fight is GSP cannot make 155. So unless they've somehow made it like a catch weight, like a 165 division or something. Well, they could do that if his last fight of, you know, the career and GSP come back. Yeah, they could. That's do what I'm saying. If both guys are going to retire, just do the fight, right? 
I just listen. GSP is a guy who said he actually hates fighting, and he fears it. Yeah. So, how old is he? Is he almost forty or forty? Forty-one? Uh, I think he's like thirty-eight. Yeah, I don't know. Thirty-eight, being out of the game for a few years, I don't see him taking that fight and risking his livelihood. My opinion. All right. Okay. So then, if that does happen, or you know, let's just say that doesn't happen. Thirty-nine, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't. I don't think it's happening. It's getting dark outside. We got to wrap this up very quickly. So if that doesn't happen, what happens? Does he fight the winner of Poirier McGregor? He says he's not fighting McGregor. I don't know if you saw him on Stephen A. Smith's show. Yeah, first, first take. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So if it's not fighting McGregor, but Poirier loses and McGregor wins, then it's got to be Ferguson, no? I think the UFC is going to... F- I know. I think the UFC is going to force him to fight Conor. How do they force and, him? Uh, they throw that Dallas in his face. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't he look don't. like a guy who's that I, concerned about millions. To he me. doesn't. He doesn't. But at the end of the day, no, it's gonna affect him. If they okay, say, so oh, you're set to like that. Hold on. Okay. Okay. Sure. Person. If Poirier beats McGregor, which I I don't think he's going to do, what yeah, uh, th- th- then? Then what happens? Is it Ferguson or Poirier? I don't. Know, I think the UFC's kind of stuck in a predicament there. I think they're gonna. You know that new guy that came in, who's a uh, he's a uh, alternate for this fight. The gate she could be played. Yeah. Uh, Michael Chandler guy from the yeah. Bellator. I think they try to maybe build him up. Give him Ferguson. If he can beat Ferguson, I think they could. Because Khabib Ferguson, Ferguson, what's it called? Dana White already said, yo, that's like that last option. Like, I'm not trying to book that fight again. Yeah. Type thing. All right. So, anyways, before we wrap up this episode, as always, we've got to do it earlier. This episode is brought to you by our presenting sponsor, Majestic Barbershop. Yeah. Located at 289 Dundas Street East in Mississauga. And they got the freshest fades. Whatever type of haircut you want. You want to get braids. They got a salon in the back for the ladies too. And even for the guys with longer hair, they'll do you up. And like we always say, it's the vibe and the culture there. I just got a fresh fade yesterday. I feel like a new bloody man. It's the consistency. You book your regular appointments. And hey, this is COVID time. We got to support our our local, you know, businesses. You know, just like everybody's hurting. But you need to get your haircut, go to somebody local, somebody that really helps your community. If you have a need or anything, and, you know, they'll, they'll help you out. You'll help them out. It's a two-way street in life, and they're really a partner in our community. So let's support them. I'll throw their IG here and their phone number. I want a little extra okay. tip. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Located at 289 Dundas Street East. Tell them you saw us on – tell them on In The Mix. Who knows? Maybe they'll give you a deal. I'm not saying they will, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, bro. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, mine's coming in there. Oh, can I get a deal? <laughs> no. No, but listen, there's no deals, but th- listen, support the small businesses and they're real great guys over there. So anyways, thanks for watching this episode of In The Mix and we'll catch you guys Thank soon. You.